So hello, uh, I'm Chris Serpentant. I'm assistant professor of philosophy. I'm an associate professor of philosophy now uh, here at the University of New Orleans. I'm using my old uh, introductory material. Uh, and I also direct the Alexis de Tocqueville Project in Law, Liberty, and Morality. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with what the Tocqueville Project does, it was established to examine the enduring questions in the history of Western uh, moral and political thought. Questions such as, what are the values of a democratic society and their justification? What is the moral basis of civil liberties and private property? Or what is the role of religion in a free society? To support this mission, we implement a number of initiatives, uh, including public lectures, panel discussions and debates, a seminar series in philosophy and political economy, a summer seminar program, the Tocqueville Project Undergraduate Fellows Program, and a high school dual enrollment program in philosophy and political economy. Uh, we can't do any of these things without the support from a number of foundations and other organizations, uh, and those include the Charles Koch Foundation, the Institute for Humane Studies at George Mason University, uh, the John Templeton Foundation, the University of New Orleans Student Government, and the UNO Department of Philosophy. Uh, and so now the reason why you are here. Uh, our speaker, uh, Robert Higgs, is an American economic historian and economist combining material from public choice, the new institutional economics, and the Austrian School of Economics, and a libertarian anarchist in political and legal theory and public policy. Higgs earned his PhD in economics from the Johns Hopkins University and has held teaching positions at the University of Washington, Lafayette College, and Seattle University. He has been a senior fellow in political economy at the Independent Institute since September 1994. Today, Bob is here to talk about the connection between war and economic prosperity. Many people believe that it was World War II that brought the United States out of the Great Depression and contributed significantly to U.S. prosperity. Bob will explain why this understanding of the connection between war and prosperity does not align with reality. Please join me in welcoming Robert Higgs. Thank you, Chris. And thank you all for being here uh, to hear what will be my, my final talk <clears throat> to a group of uh, college students, uh, with one exception, I'm, I'm going to go up to George Mason University a couple of times next academic year and uh, be a visiting professor for a couple of stints, once, once in the fall and uh, once in uh, the spring. But uh, I've been visiting uh, campuses and giving talks like this, more or less, uh, since 1967, and you're the last one. So uh, if that makes you feel good, maybe you finally got rid of this guy. Uh, good. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's been a real experience for me because, uh, for one thing, I got to go around and see a lot of different schools uh, stretching from Europe and Latin America to all over the United States and uh, met a lot of students, uh, met a lot of faculty members, and so that's been a, a highlight of my career. You know, the, the, the bread and butter of a professor's career is right in the classroom or, you know, working uh, on one-to-one -one basis with students. But, but this kind of uh, traveling around is, uh, is kind of the spice of it in a way uh, because it's something out of the ordinary and it's uh, and an opportunity for, for the, uh, the traveler to learn some things about different places he might never otherwise have an opportunity to visit. Uh, so it's been, uh, it's been a, an important part of my career and uh, been at it a long time. So uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, uh, World War II. And this is a, a, an illustration of a larger uh, issue, which is, uh, as Chris said, the connection between war and economic prosperity. Now, it's interesting that, that there's even any need to discuss this. Because if we weren't in the United States, the idea that, that war might be any, anything other than destructive and abhorrent <laughs> would, would just be crazy, you know? You don't have to explain to any European or Asian or Latin American why war is not a good thing for the economy. Uh, they understand that because, and unfortunately, in many parts of the world, they have 
had war right there where they live. And if you're in the midst of one, it's obvious this is not a boon to the economy or humanity or anything else. It's a horror. But the reason Americans have come to think differently, uh, at least with regard to World War II, uh, has everything to do with the, the fact that World War II was preceded by this decade or more of very bad economic performance we call the Great Depression. And uh, this stretched all the way from beginning in the middle of 1929 all the way up until the United States uh, became involved uh, actively in World War II. And in my view, it actually continued, although in a different form, during the war and didn't end until uh, the end of the war in late 1945 and especially in the year 1946. Uh, that view, however, the view that World War II only changed the form of the Great Depression rather than ended it, is very much a minority view. And in fact, uh, it was a view I arrived at because I was teaching uh, American economic history and researching in that field as well. And uh, when I had begun to do that and had talked about the war for a few years, it became quite clear to me that the way Americans understood and the way historians wrote about World War II was, uh, was misguided, was mistaken, was, was just flat out wrong. And so I, I began to alter my teaching to take that into account and to try to explain to my students why uh, what the textbooks said about World War II uh, was was uh, not defensible. Uh, but I never wrote much about this uh, until really the 1990s or perhaps the late 80s when I started. But I wrote quite a lot uh, from the early 90s to the early 2000s. And uh, uh, the most important pieces I wrote uh, were brought together in, uh, in one of my books called Depression, War, and Cold War. And uh, the first five chapters have to do with this question of the relationship between the Great Depression, the war, and the post-war recovery of the American economy, which I insist was the real recovery from the Great Depression. So if you want to actually learn about this, the thing to do is not so much sit here for an hour and listen to me talk but read <laughs> uh, one or more of the chapters in this book uh, because that's where the evidence is laid out carefully, where I discuss nuances, uh, subtleties uh, associated with the subject, talk about how it's been seen by other scholars, and so forth. Uh, in, in other words, this is a serious discussion of it, and I'm going to in the course of my talk today, not really be able to talk in that same level of detail. It would be extremely boring, for one thing, if I were to do that. So what I'm going to try to do is give you an understanding of the basic elements of my revisionist story that are at stake here. And uh, that may tease you to read more. If so, you can go to my book, uh, or if not, then you're finished. But uh, at all events, you will have been alerted to the fact that the way this experience is understood and has been understood ever since it took place, not only by the general public, but also by nearly all historians and economists, is problematic. Okay? Uh, and it's not that this is just history, that this is all said and done, because this experience is still used today by economists to justify various political policies, uh, policies for dealing with, say, the recession that began uh, at the beginning of 2008 and, in some respects, has not ended yet. So uh, if you read, for example, uh, the writings of Professor Paul Krugman in his columns in the New York Times uh, 
he's a very famous economist. He is a Nobel Prize winner in economics, and so he has a lot of standing in the economics profession. But uh, what he constantly emphasizes when, when he talks about this desirable economic policy right now, what would have been desirable in 2008 and the years afterward, he talks about how World War I taught us a lesson. It should have taught us the lesson. And that lesson is the lesson of basic elementary Keynesian economics. So basic, I call it vulgar Keynesianism. It's the kind of understanding that uh, a lot of ordinary people have, journalists, politicians, uh, and pundits. Uh, they tend to think along the same lines. And these are lines that you could have found laid out very clearly uh, for example, in a textbook published in 1949 by Paul Samuelson, another very famous American economist, his textbook was just called Economics. It's the most widely used economics textbook ever written, uh, translated into many languages, used for now more than almost 70 years since it was uh, published, still in use today, uh, although they're Samuelson is dead now, and former co-author carries the book forward. But nonetheless, this is not just an old idea I'll be talking about. It's an idea that's very much alive, the idea that government can step into a situation uh, where the economy is not performing well, and by massive spending, which is paid for by going into debt, the government can effectively substitute for the absence of private spending that has brought about recessionary conditions. And this is probably the most basic of all propositions derived from Keynesian theory, the idea that a dollar spent by the government is a perfect substitute for a dollar spent by private individuals. And it's that kind of uh, understanding that uh, deeply affects the way economists and historians have understood World War II. And in a word, it's wrong. The idea that the government's dollar spent is a perfect substitute for a private consumer or a private investor's dollar spent is simply wrong and should have been understood as wrong by any decent economist from the start. But the reason it wasn't understood is that Keynesian economics is aggregative economics. It's a kind of understanding of the theory that collapses all economic activity into a handful of interrelated concepts. And most important, it sees the economy as producing one output, one. It's called output, and it's measured with a statistic uh, called gross domestic product. And if you've ever taken a basic economics course, you've, you've run into this. Or if you just read the newspapers, you, you run into discussion all the time about what's happening to GDP. Okay? That's the, the most uh, consulted measure of how well the economy is performing. Does it produce a high rate of aggregate output or not? Is the economy growing as measured by growth of GDP? Or falling in the same sense, okay? And if you think about it that way, what you're doing is collapsing the thousands, the literally millions of different kinds of goods and services an economy such as the U.S. economy produces. You're collapsing all those into one, one, one big glop. And you're calling that output. But when you do that, you lose all the decisions that people make in the world involving specific outputs and how they produce them, where they produce them, to whom they sell them, and, and all the, the many other questions that are involved if you're producing bread or shoes or computers or whatever it is. Okay? If you're looking at specific forms of economic output, then you have a lot of decisions to make that involve comparisons between your product situation and other products. You look at costs in the same way. 
the basic notion of all modern economics is the notion of scarcity, that there's not enough resources in the world to allow people to have everything they want that requires those resources for their production. And if there's scarcity, then people being unable to have everything they want must choose among the things that are feasible for them to produce. Somehow they must decide what to produce and what to forego producing. And when they do that, uh, this choice that they make gives rise to what economists call the opportunity cost of any action. To take an action means to not take some alternative action that produced a valuable outcome. Okay? So we've got these interrelated concepts, scarcity, choice, and opportunity cost. But we don't see these, these uh, concepts at all in Keynesian macroeconomics. We have one output. We're not choosing output A and sacrificing some output B. There's no such trade-off made. Uh, so there's no choice. There's no opportunity cost. Uh, it's as if in Keynesian economics and other schools of modern macroeconomics, opportunity cost has somehow been washed out of economics. But that's like washing the very heart out of a subject to, to think about it that way. And so uh, Keynesian economics uses concepts such as the multiplier uh, to give us the idea that because a dollar spent by government is a perfect substitute for a dollar spent by private parties, either consumers or investors, that, that uh, we don't have to make trade-offs. We don't have to bear opportunity costs. And indeed, if the government spends money, it ends up generating income that washes over into private income increases and allows people to spend more for everything. It's like magic, see? You can create magic you can, just by having the government spend money that it doesn't have and must borrow. Okay? You suddenly create valuable goods and services. You know, if only that were so. Yeah. What a wonderful world we would live in. You know, Bolivia might be the richest nation on earth. Oh, probably Zimbabwe. Okay? Because in those countries and many others, the government's created so much money and spent it for their purposes that, <laughs> that you know, they should have created heaven on earth with all that government spending. But they didn't. They just created monetary inflation and drove up the prices of what was there and discouraged people from producing more things that people really valued uh, because it was no longer possible to count on the value of money any time after the next minute. Literally, <laughs> you couldn't make a deal far ahead because you didn't know how much value the money would lose in purchasing power from one day to the next. When this has happened in various times and places in history, people have been observed doing things like making a purchase by hauling a wheelbarrow full of money to buy a loaf of bread or a bottle of wine. Okay? Uh, there are many illustrations like this from Germany in 1923 when they had a famous episode of hyperinflation, which the German government generated to pay for things that it had promised to supply people. And the German government was a wreck after World War I, and so it wasn't very productive. And But the government didn't solve this problem by printing a lot of money. It just created an additional problem, which was an unreliable medium of exchange. And that made the Germans actually poorer than they would have been if the government had never undertaken that action, okay? So this subject of World War II uh, basically can be viewed as, here's a claim made by most American economists and historians that magic worked. And my counterclaim is, no, it didn't. And so I'm going to walk you through the several of the leading dimensions of this claim and show you what's wrong with each one of them. Now, as I say, the essential background is the Great Depression. The Great Depression lasted more than a decade, in my view, more than a decade and a half. Uh, 
But during the first decade or so, the most remarkable feature of the Great Depression was mass unemployment. The unemployment, start, unemployment rate started rising in 1930, got higher in 31, higher in 32, higher in 33. By that time, after four years of rising unemployment, about 25% of the whole labor force was unemployed, officially counted as unemployed. Now, of the people who were working at that time, uh, about one-third of them were working part-time when they wanted to work full-time. So if you add these two groups, what you have by 1933 is a full half of the entire labor force that's either totally unemployed or partially unemployed. And, and, and that's horrible, right? I mean, how bad can the employment situation get? It had never been anything nearly so bad before, and it was never nearly that bad again, thank goodness. But there in the early 30s, it got very, very bad indeed. And uh, it was nearly as bad in 32, 33, 34. Sometimes economists make this experience look as if it's a V-shaped. You know, the economy declines rapidly, and then it recovers rapidly from the low point in 33. It really wasn't shaped that way. Uh, it was more U-shaped with a shallow bottom that extended for about three years. Uh, but in any event, uh, mass unemployment is something that lasted a long time. Uh, it affected not only the whole economic situation, but it affected people's mentality, too, their thinking, their state of mind, uh, and especially people your age. If, if today we could shift all of you back to 1930, 31, and then let you live the next 10 years of your life the way people that age lived that decade, you'd find that it was extremely discouraging for young people. It was very hard for them to get good jobs. Very hard indeed to get any kind of job. Because think about that. If, you, if you've got a quarter of the labor force totally unemployed and another quarter of the labor force looking for a better full-time job. Now, when an employer does want to hire somebody, <laughs> that employer has his pick, right? There are going to be people out there who are older, they have experience in the job, they have skills that people your age haven't yet acquired. And so he's not going to hire a young person when he can hire somebody that's likely to work out better on the job. And that was a situation that lasted that whole decade. And also, when some people were unemployed for years and years and years on end, which, which many were, they just never got a job. So they were always scrapping by, getting by with relatives' help or, uh, you know, doing odd jobs or doing jobs off the record or, or even doing criminal jobs, you know. Uh, when, when they weren't employed in a, in a job they could talk about uh, for almost 10 years, and they went out to apply for a job, they didn't look good. An employer saying, look, this, this, this guy's been out of work for eight years, nine years. Uh, even if he used to have skills, they've atrophied. He hasn't been using his skills, exercising his knowledge and experience. He's been losing value as an employee. And so that, that kind of effect of long-term employment, which always exists, you know, it ex exists today when people have been unemployed for a long time. But that was especially important in the, in the 1930s and very discouraging to young people. Now, when, when World War II began in Europe in, uh, in September 1939, uh, the American economy was starting to recover from from a little depression within a depression, which had uh, made 1938 a, a bad year, even after some recovery in the preceding four years. Uh, but the economy was, was recovering. It hadn't recovered fully yet, but it was, it was headed in the right direction, at least, finally. And, uh, and, and at, that, at that time, the uh, 
the American government, President Roosevelt in particular, were immediately interested in aiding the British. Remember, back in World War I, the U.S. and Great Britain had been allies. Many Americans had worked closely with the British during World War I, got to know people, uh, established friendships, established close connections with them, uh, sometimes very close personal friendships as well. And, and Franklin Roosevelt was one such person. In World War I, he was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy. And so he worked closely with British naval officials and other British officials during World War I. He was extremely pro-British. Okay. So when, uh, when the war began, uh, Roosevelt was eager to somehow work toward getting the United States involved in the war to help the British, who were really up against it in the early years of the war. Uh, they were among other things, uh, being subjected to aerial bombardment by German aircraft you know, who flew over and bombed extensively in London and, and other parts of the country, destroyed a lot of uh, property, killed quite a few people in the process. Um, but although Roosevelt was very keen to involve the U.S. in that war to help the British, most Americans were exactly against it, totally against it. And the reason is that uh, almost as soon as World War I ended, and during the war, a lot of Americans had been highly enthusiastic, even hysterically enthusiastic about uh, the war and involvement in it and fighting it successfully and so forth, even though the United States was a very peripheral party in World War I. Got there very late on after the major powers had been fighting for, for three years, and in terms of blood spilled, was a was a very minor participant in World War One, but an important one in terms of supplying the French and the British. So, so uh, Americans went over there. They fought. They. Uh, over 100,000 of them lost their lives. Uh, several hundred thousand were wounded, some of them disabled for life. And Americans looked back at that after the war ended and said, this was crazy. The United States never should have done this. They didn't have a good reason for involvement in this war. You know, things like freedom of the seas, which was President Wilson's rationale for the U.S declaration of war. Well, that was basically nutty, you know. There's a war going on, and Wilson was saying, uh, e even though the U.S. ships sail through a war zone, and even though some of them carry war supplies <laughs> to Germany's enemies, they should be free from any molestation. Well, that's quite a wild claim, I would say, and everybody else thought so too, including the Germans. And even though the Germans respected that, you know, attempt to not attack American ships for a long time, they finally reached a point beyond their tolerance, and they declared that they would henceforth attack any and all ships, including Americans, uh, bringing supplies to their enemies. And they did so, uh, which is quite understandable. But at all events, uh, Americans looked back on World War I and said, crazy, never should have done it, no good reason, lots of people kill for nothing. And most importantly, when they looked at the outcome of the war, what they saw was that despite all the great slogans about the defense of democracy and freedom and so forth, the war was basically a conflict among dynastic powers. You know? None of them highly democratic, not even the British. You know? A lot of people couldn't even vote in Britain at that time, adults. Uh, so what, what had happened is that you know, the French Empire, the British Empire, the Russian Empire, the German Empire all got kind of gone to war along with Turkey, which was an empire in its own right. And uh, so the, these imperial powers had had a gigantic contest at slaughtering one another. And, and at the end of it, then the, the victors sliced up the booty you know, they took lands that had been part of uh, 
the German Empire and, uh, and uh, part of the Turkish Empire, Russian Empire, and they created a whole bunch of new nations out of what had previously been parts of those empires. So it was obvious to any onlooker that this was just sort of war with land grab. It was an extension of imperial power. It had nothing to do with democracy and freedom and so forth. That was just a, a ruse to get the ordinary people to support the war. And so Americans reacted very badly. They said, never again. We won't be fooled like this again. And so the, 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 the public opinion in, the, in this country was very hostile to war and hostile to militarism throughout the 20s and 30s. Uh, so much so that Congress uh, passed four different acts uh, for neutrality uh, in the 1930s, which made it much more difficult for the United States to involve itself in a way that might drag it into uh, other people's wars. Okay? Well, that was the situation Roosevelt faced after 1939 in wanting to get Americans to support U.S. Uh, efforts to aid the British. So he was up against it. Uh, as a result, there was a period of conflict there in 1940 and 41, in which a lot of anti-war people, including people in the Congress, uh, didn't want to do anything to help the British, didn't want to get involved, wanted to keep the neutrality acts in force, although they were amended some. And, uh, uh, and nonetheless, there were people who said, well, OK, even though we're neutral, we have to prepare ourselves better militarily to defend ourselves. Uh, because of the anti-militarism and anti-war sentiment in the 1920s and 30s, the US military establishment in 1940 was tiny. It was the 16th biggest army in the world. Okay? The great United States in 1940 had the 16th biggest military. I mean, countries like Bulgaria had a bigger army than the United States. Okay? So that was the situation. In, in order to, to help the British, the president had first get American public opinion changed so that it was willing to support government action to help them. And it had to build up the US military forces so that its help would be of some substance. So it would matter, you know. And with this tiny army, what could they do to help the British? The Navy, the American Navy was more substantial, but still not very big. So that was his situation. And uh, a number of actions were pushed through Congress in 1940. Uh, to move the United States in the direction of preparedness, it was called, uh, building up the military, building up war industries to support the military, uh, building up facilities to train, uh, equip, transport soldiers and sailors. Okay? So this, this period is very tense, 1940 and 41 in the United States. Tremendous number of people still opposed U.S. involvement in the war, even as late as the very uh, month or two before the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, a great majority of Americans, when polled, uh, opposed U.S. involvement in the war. Now, that didn't stop Roosevelt from taking actions of various kinds, including some that were simply illegal or unconstitutional. He was a very shrewd politician, and he knew how to do things and get away with them is uh, there's kind of a law of politics, and that is that fait accompli, you know, something that's done deal, <laughs> can carry the day. If you just go do something, you know, without asking, is it permissible, and it's going to be much harder for the opponents to overturn what you've done once you've done it. So when, when Roosevelt made uh, a, a so-called destroyer deal in late 1940 with the British, he, he took 40 U.S. Navy destroyers, uh, declared them to be obsolete, which they weren't, otherwise the British would not have had any interest in them, and basically gave them to the, to the, the British, the British Empire, in exchange for leaseholds on various British colonies and possessions in the Western Hemisphere. This is an obvious fraud. Okay? 
The U.S. didn't get anything of much value to itself. In exchange, the President gave away part of the U.S. Navy. But once it was done, uh, there wasn't any effective way to say, oh, wait, we take that back. Give us those ships back. <laughs> uh, and the British were using them for anti-submarine warfare, which they needed very badly at the time. The German submarines were sinking a lot of the goods being brought into Britain from overseas, including foodstuffs. So food was scarce in Britain during the war as a result. Okay? Uh, in 1941, Roosevelt made another big deal with the British called Lend-Lease. Lend-Lease was basically a way of giving military assistance in the form of supplies to the, to the British and others, uh, the French, while they were still in the war, uh, and others, uh, not so much, but uh, giving them supplies uh, with the pretext that they weren't actually giving them these supplies, uh, they, they would be paid ultimately for it. But everybody knew the British were never going to pay for, the, for these things, uh, that they wouldn't even be able to pay for them. And it was a massive amount of stuff. At the time, uh, when, when a dollar had much greater purchasing power, lend-lease assistance during the war amounted to more than $50 billion. This was a critical amount of support for the British. And after the Germans and the Russians went to war, then Lend-Lease assistance was also given on a fairly large scale to the Russians, which was you know, not the bulk of their equipment or supplies, but important, uh, particularly for certain types of uh, goods, such as trucks used to haul military supplies to their enormous Red Army fighting the Germans. So here's Roosevelt weaseling the country toward war and provoking the Japanese with a variety of trade restrictions that the U.S. initiated. And the Japanese tried, tried to negotiate these things, but the U.S. refused, basically, to negotiate in good faith. And finally, the Japanese, uh, when they were embargoed by not only the Americans, but the Dutch and British colonies in Southeast Asia. These are the sources for Japanese raw materials, which they needed to have to operate an industrial economy and have a military, a modern military. The US embargoed all those things, along with those other two powers, from the middle of 1941. And that put the Japanese up against the wall. They had to either decide they were going to capitulate to US demands, including withdrawing all their troops from China, where they had, had been since 1937. Uh, so give up all their gains on the mainland of Asia uh, to satisfy the Americans to take off the embargo. Or they had to just you know, resort to arms, uh, go attack Southeast Asia, take those territories, get their raw materials, and meanwhile try to fend off the Americans who had a big naval presence in Hawaii while they did it to protect the flank of their thrust uh, and to the south. So that's why they attacked Pearl Harbor. It was part, part, not because they were crazy, uh, not because they thought they could defeat the United States in a war, but because they had to have the materials. They couldn't get them any other way except by capitulation to U.S. demands. And that was not consistent with either the militarism of the Japanese government or the kind of importance of saving face in Japanese culture. Uh, but they hoped that they could keep the Americans disabled for long enough to negotiate with them. Finally, the Americans would see the virtue of, uh, uh, of cutting a deal. The Americans wouldn't cut a deal even then. They just wanted all-out war. And that's what they got. And this is sometimes called the back door to war. Roosevelt wanted war against Germany, but Germany and Japan were allied. So by getting the Japanese to attack the US, he effectively dragged the Germans in to attack, uh, to declare war on the US. And then we were at war. So Roosevelt got what he wanted in the end. Now, after particularly the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, all this anti-war resistance just evaporated overnight. Hardly anybody any longer opposed the war. They, 
They said, we've been attacked, we're going to defend ourselves. They didn't know, in very many cases, that the Japanese had been goaded into the attack. They didn't care, for that matter. All they knew was that the Japanese had attacked the U.S. Navy in Hawaii and it killed 3,000 people and, and, and sunk a lot of ships. So the U.S. was at war all out from that time on. Now, when the U.S. started building up its military in late 1940, even before any of this outright fighting that followed Pearl Harbor, uh, Congress took a number of actions to, to build up the military and build up military supply industries. And one of the most important, actually critical <coughs> actions taken was to impose a military draft conscription. Okay? Uh, it was not possible, at least at any pay that the Congress was willing to set to attract enough volunteers to build up a substantial army. So, like many nations of the world, they just enslaved these people. They just took them. You got a letter from the War Department that said, congratulations, you've been drafted. Show up at this location, usually in about a week. And your choice was, uh, if you didn't show up, they would send the uh, police and FBI after you and, and send you to prison. So you can go in the armed forces or you can go to prison. And if you were in prison for evading the draft, you would have a very rough time of it there because the murderers and rapists and robbers in prison took a dim view of draft dodgers. <laughs> Think of that. <laughs> Think of that. <laughs> that right? draft dodging that's worse than murder rape and robbery apparently uh, the way these prisons were operated which is a bizarre situation but that's the one that existed so uh, not many people chose to go to prison and of those who did there were there were about 6,000 uh, about 5,000 of the 6,000 were Jehovah's Witnesses who, who chose to stand by their faith All the other Christians in the country found some reason to compromise the teachings of Jesus and march off and obey the state when the chips were down. That's another interesting thing you see about World War II. Nationalism cuts deeper than religion for nearly all Americans. Not just then, but now, and not just in regard to war, but in regard to practically anything you can think of. Okay, so as soon as the war buildup started, and especially after the attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941, the U.S. economy started booming in a sense that they were producing all this war output. And if you take a standard economist Keynesian approach to analyzing this situation economically, this looks like a big economic boom, right? GDP is rising. Because the government has stepped in and it's spending huge amounts of money for airplanes and tanks and ships and what have you. It's paying millions of soldiers because by the end of the war, the U.S. had drafted more than 10 million men. Now, to put that in perspective, the pre-war labor force in the United States was a little over 50 million persons, male and female. 10 million people drafted into the Army is, is, is almost 20% of the entire labor force. If you did that today, 20% of the labor force, that would be about 60 million people. Imagine today, suddenly in a few years, pulling 60 million Americans into the Army. It's unthinkable. Well, it was almost unthinkable then, but they did it, so we know it could be done. It could be thought and done, because that's what they did. And in addition to the 10 million who were drafted, uh, they induced uh, millions more to enlist to, as volunteers. Because if you were drafted, they just put you in any job they wanted to put you in, and that job was very likely to be in the infantry. And that meant that your job in the war would be basically living in a filthy hole, 
uh, that you dug or a shell had blasted out of the ground, uh, dirty, covered with lice, scared to death, getting your limbs blown off by artillery shells. Right? That was not a good job. <laughs> and so even people who were very patriotic, who wanted to join the armed forces, really didn't want to be in the infantry very often. And who can blame them? Now, being in the Air Force, which a lot of people tried to join, it was part of the Army then, uh, the Army Air Corps it was called. Uh, that was better, not because it was always safer. And in fact, if you were in a bomber crew over Europe, it was very, very unsafe. Right? Because uh, you needed to, to generally fly about 25 missions uh, before you had any hope of getting transferred to something else. But surviving 25 missions over parts of Germany and Italy was the devil's work. If you've never read a novel called Catch-22, do it. Okay? It may be one of the most important books you'll ever read. It's also a great novel, you know, if you're interested in literature. But apart from that, uh, it, it's, it's about a character who's in the Army Air Corps in, in Italy, and they're flying bombing missions over mainland Italy, and uh, this guy, Yosarian, is a, is a different kind of cat. <laughs> He's not interested at all in patriotism. He just wants to stay alive. And so he does all kinds of antics to try to get out of being sent on these bombing missions, you know, pretending to be insane in all sorts of various ways. <clears throat> but his officers won't fall for it. <clears throat> so... That's, that's the, the heart of the story, but it's a, it's a wonderful book and one of the best books you could ever read to understand the nature of men in war uh, and what it's like. And that was, the, that was the kind of war in which you could at least be clean. You know, in the Army Air Corps, at least you died clean instead of lice infested. Uh, in the Navy, that wasn't necessarily going to be safe either, but again, You'd be clean. <laughs> you, you, you wouldn't be covered with dirt uh, when you were blown up out in the middle of the Pacific. So people joined the military to avoid the infantry. And ultimately, more than 16 million individuals served at some time during the war. And when the war uh, ended uh, in, in September 1945, the total forces in the military at that time was more than 12 million. Not all men, there were also some women by that time, a couple hundred thousand women in various women's auxiliary corps for each of the services. But, uh, but again, 12 million, that's, uh, that's about a quarter of the pre-war labor force. And then if you add all the people who we're working in war plants to supply these warriors. It's a comparable number of people. Not quite as many, but similar. So what you have at the height of the war is, uh, so I gotta use my clicker here. Didn't work. Here we go. All right. This is the way I broke down the way unemployment was solved in World War II. You start out here, defense employment, <clears throat> that's a, your uniform military and the people in war plants. Uh, that's, that's less than 2% of the total. Uh, Labor force in 1940, that's fiscal year 1940, ended in the middle of the year then. But look at what happens to defense employment. It rises very rapidly after 1940, and during the four peak war years, it's approximately 40% of the whole labor force is either in uniform or in a supply industry. Okay? Now, if you diverted that big a proportion of the labor force today, it would be about 
60 million people. Imagine taking 60 million people out of the labor force and putting them into bomb factories and putting them into uniform. Today, we have three, three to four million tops, either in the military or in war industries. Three to four, even though our labor force is now like 100, 150 million instead of one third that big, which it was in those days. So this is, this is a gigantic withdrawal of people from the labor force. And that's why unemployment disappeared. Okay? That's it. There's no more to this story. That's the whole story right there. You don't have to look at Keynesian explanations with the government suddenly spending lots of money or monetarist explanations with the Federal Reserve System suddenly changing credit conditions so the money stock grows rapidly. Those things happened. They all happened. But that's not why unemployment disappeared. You know? If you have 8 or 10% of the labor force unemployed, and then you draft 20% of the labor force and employ a comparable number in war plants, you're not going to have any unemployment. It does, doesn't matter if the government had increased its spending at all or the Fed had increased the money stock at all. The whole story is told once you, once you take that many people out of the labor market. And that's what happened in World War II. Uh, it's not something that really requires any kind of economic model to understand. All it requires is knowing the facts. And that's, that's what they look like. Uh, now, what you see are when the war ends, like in 1946, uh, that 40% drops to less than 9 in 1946, and then it falls to a little over 5% after that. So there's a massive demobilization of the military forces when the war ended. And at the same time, the civilian economy boomed for the first time since the 1920s. Uh, and that, that is the only sense in which you could say the war got the economy out of the Depression is because it, it altered political conditions which ultimately led to the revival of private investment and private consumption. But the war itself was not prosperous, not at all. Now, another basis for saying it was I'll make it move, I think. There we use, go. Use okay. the arrows. Just, right I'll now. just stick with the arrows. Another reason for, for, for thinking that the, uh, the war w was itself a time of prosperity has to do with this gross domestic product measure, uh, which is closely related to gross national product. They're slightly different in their definition. And economists used to always use gross national product and then in the past uh, 20, 25 years, they've switched over to gross domestic product. If you look at the numbers, they're almost identical uh, in, in that period, certainly. So what you see here is that uh, depending on which estimates you look at, uh, the war looks as if it was a time of gigantic growth in national output. Okay? If you look, for example, at the, that second column, estimate of 1990 by the Commerce Department, it looks as if uh, GDP was, was almost 93% greater uh, in, in, in the peak war, war production year, uh, 1944, than it had been in 1939. It's like almost doubled national output in just a little more than, well, actually half a decade. Now, that doesn't happen, okay? That doesn't happen. That's never been measured like that before. Uh, and uh, in fact, if you, if you look at it in this graph, the solid line uh, that has that big bulge in it uh, during the war years, that, that's a, a plot of real 
GDP. In this case, uh, I put it in logarithms so I can see the rates of growth by the slope of the line. But, but the important thing is there's this huge bulge. Historians call this the miracle of production during the war. So the claim is that, you know, it doesn't matter what I say about disappearance of unemployment. This was a hugely productive time. It was prosperous. There it is. There, there are the data that show it. And indeed, that's what economists will tell you if you ask them. At least 95% of them will say, well, there are the data. Professor Krugman will certainly show you. Uh, there are the data. There's the war boom right there. Uh, and historians write about things like carnivals of consumption, more guns and more butter. Okay? That's the way we sometimes talk about opportunity cost in the first week of an economics course. You know? We say that there's a certain potential to produce, and if you produce more one kind of good, like guns, military outputs, you have to sacrifice some civilian outputs, butter. Okay? But the Keynesian story, as I said before, is, is no trade-off. It's miraculous. You just get more of everything. Even consumers are better off. Carnival of consumption. Never had it so good. I'm quoting historians. Okay? Never had it so good. Well, what's going on here? Uh, first of all, I should point out something. This, this dashed line that starts with the 1929 value of the, of the, the real GDP and ends uh, passing through 1948 is drawn that way because these were peak years in the business cycle. They were years when resources were quite fully employed. The unemployment rate was normal and low, less than 5% both years. And, and so if we draw a straight line on a log chart like that, what we're drawing is a rate of growth uh, projection connecting those two, two years uh, with their actual values. Now, what that means is if the economy had grown steadily between 1929 and 1948, it would have gone along that dashed line. But as you can see, of course, first it collapsed during the early 30s and came back some, didn't get back to the trend line until the war, then shot way above the trend line. But the trend line is a, is a line that shows you the economy's potential to produce. How much can it produce if it res uses its resources in that year as fully as they were used in 1929 or 1948? Okay. How can you produce more than your potential? Isn't that a contradiction in terms? Yes, it is. So this war bulge seems to be saying the impossible was done during the war. It's our miracle again. Now, there are ways that make sense to explain this. One of the ways is that the economy could have produced more than its potential by eating up its capital stock. Normally, see, each year the economy is producing some of the buildings, equipment, tools are wearing out or becoming obsolete. So they have to be replaced. And this depreciation replacement is a normal part of any business activity. Okay? If you're running a business and you don't replace or repair your, your uh, capital as it wears out, your physical capital, then you can't run the business for long. Okay? If you have a taxi business but you don't keep your taxis repaired, pretty soon they, they don't even run. Your cars won't operate. Okay? Same for any kind of physical capital. It has to be kept in repair, and uh, when the technology changes, new technology has to be introduced in place of the old that was used. Yeah? Otherwise, we wouldn't have this computer here. We'd have an adding machine or you know, an abacus or something here. Uh, but depreciation allowances are part of every business activity, and that's true of the whole economy as well. During the war, a lot of normal depreciation was not fixed. Bus lines, truck lines, railroads, they just had to keep doing the best they could with the stuff that was still running. You know, patching up stuff, just anything they could do to keep it, keep it working. Because the demand was very high. The demand was very high. It wasn't a matter of not having enough customers. Uh, 
they had this massive government buying going on for the war economy, and then the civilians were earning all this money, especially the ones working in war plants, and so they wanted to buy things too, if the government would permit them to buy things. It didn't permit them to buy certain things. But, but the, the problem was not lack of customer, uh, lack of buyers. The, the problem was having the ability to supply all of these customers when your stuff is falling apart. For example, the, the government put price, price controls on practically every product, including rents for apartments. Okay? And most people lived in apartments they rented in those days, they, you know, about half of them or so. So if the landlord is not allowed to raise the rent enough to cover the increases in costs of maintaining the building, he just stops doing repairs, stops doing even normal maintenance. The place wears out, it deteriorates, you know, the plumbing needs to be fixed. It's not. It's got, you know, rags wrapped around the pipes to stop a leak or whatever, you know. Some kind of jerry-rigged operation is going on in people's homes. Uh, and you couldn't build new apartments or housing during the war because the government didn't permit materials for that purpose. All the materials were used to build barracks for 12 million persons in the, in the armed forces or, or, or to build war plants, shipyards. Okay? None was left over for civilian consumption. Uh, and so the building stock of the country is just wearing out during the war. Now, ordinarily, say, when you compute GDP, one of the components of it is the, is the depreciation spending taking place in the economy. And at that time, the normal depreciation spending was about 10% of total GDP every year. About 10% of what was spent was to make up for wear and tear and obsolescence. But that's really getting short shrift during the war. And so it makes it look as if you're getting more net output there when you're really just eating up your seed corn. Okay? You're eating up your capacity to produce later on by not keeping your capital stock up properly. And the, the, but probably a much more important factor was not that, that in this miracle of production. It was not so much that it was an expression of capital uh, accounting failure, uh, but an expression of prices that were meaningless. Okay? About 40% of the total national output uh, during the war was for war purposes. Let's see if I got, I don't have a, a chart that shows that. Uh, but one way to see it is, here's what the profile of growth looks like. GDP, uh, everything, okay? And you can see the declines in the early 30s and then the rapid growth during the war. Okay. But what was happening during the war to the private part of GDP? Whoops. There you get a very different picture of the war. There you see that when the war gets going in 42 and 43, private output is actually falling. There's no Keynesian miracle here. There's no multiplier. There's you're getting more guns because you're getting less butter. <laughs> okay. The private part of GDP is falling very substantially. I mean, you have more than 10% decline in private GDP in 1942. That was like the worst year of the Great Depression in the early 30s. Worst year. So these statements about carnival of consumption and Americans never had it so good are just nutty. It wasn't like that at all. And even this doesn't tell you how great the civilian economy suffered, how greatly it suffered. Because as I've been telling you here, there were some things that you just couldn't buy at all, no matter how much money you had in your pocket. You couldn't buy a new house. Okay? You couldn't buy construction materials to repair your apartment. You, you couldn't buy a new car because the automobile industry, which was the biggest in the United States in those days, was closed in the spring of 1942. The government simply ordered the car producers to stop producing civilian materials and transform their plants to satisfy government demands for airplanes and tanks and 
military trucks and all the rest of the things that wanted to make war. So that's what happened in Detroit and the other automobile centers. They, they shifted over to making military equipment uh, throughout the war. So there were no, uh, there were, were no 1943 Fords or 44 or 45. There were a handful of 46 Fords, <laughs> uh, not many, because it took quite a while to, you know, give up the plant's configuration for producing bomber planes or tanks and put it in shape with equipment and layout to produce civilian automobiles. So even for years afterward, uh, I remember when I was a little kid, people used to talk about getting a new car. Uh, and what they would do, they'd go to the dealership and order one. And then they would wait for the order to be filled, sometimes six months, sometimes a year, till finally the producer would be able to supply the one that had been ordered. Okay. And, it, and it was many years before they got the position where they could basically satisfy consumer demands. At the time, consumers wanted to place an order. They had showrooms and inventories of automobiles ready. Okay the way we, we do now. If you want to buy a car, you don't have to wait around uh, for what you buy. Okay? But that was not the case during the war. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of ordinary consumer items were rationed, which means that uh, you couldn't buy as many as you want, e even if you had the money. You were restricted on the amount. Every human being was issued a ration book. Several of them, actually, there were different ones, like one for gasoline, uh, one, I think there was a separate one for meat, uh, uh, one for automobile tires, and so forth. But for general th food items, everybody had this ration ticket book. And when you went to buy things, there was a two price system for all those rationed items. You had to pay the money price that the seller asked. And you had to surrender the number of ration coupons that the government had set for that month. And it changed the, the ration price every month. Uh, so if you want to buy, say, uh, tires for your bicycle. Well, you could only buy so many. Uh, if you wanted to buy tires for your automobile, it was very, very difficult to do. And in those days, the tires were crummy. They didn't last like tires today which ran 40, 50,000 miles sometimes. They wore out very quickly and needed replacement. Uh, but people had to just keep driving, patching up their old tires and making do because they, they, they weren't permitted with the rationing system to buy enough tires to keep their cars going or enough gasoline really to, to do much other than go to work. Uh, they only got a few gallons a week for an ordinary civilian person. Uh, you got more if you were like a doctor. You could get as many, much gas as you wanted. Uh, I think actually even priests, ministers, <laughs> got got uh, as much gasoline as they wanted. Uh, but the ordinary person just got a few gallons a week. And the cars in those days didn't get mileage the way they do now. So you're lucky if you got 15 miles to gallon. Uh, so. This was no consumer paradise. This was bad. When, uh, when my, my family during the war decided to, uh, to leave Oklahoma, where my dad was working in the oil industry, and uh, move up to Portland, Oregon, to work in a shipyard up there. And my dad went up and welded uh, ships together for the rest of the war. I, I was six months old when this trip took place. And we had a Model A Ford. Uh, which is already kind of worn out. It went back to the late 20s, and the tires were worn out. And in driving from Oklahoma to Oregon, uh, the car had about 40 flats. And every time it had a flat, I had to stop, my dad get out, jack up the car, take off the tire, Tires had tubes in those days. Take the tube out of the tire, put a patch on it. You had a patch kit all the time. Put a patch on it, put it back in the tire, put the tire back on, pump it up with a hand pump, and then go on for a few miles before your next flat. Okay. This was the 
Guns and butter, the historians talk about. Consumer paradise. <laughs> it's all a myth. Okay? It's, a, it's a myth. It's true that anybody who wanted a job during the war could get one. You know, if you weren't in the military, you wanted a job, you could get one like that. Employers were frantic to hire anybody they could find. But when you got the money, <laughs> there were a lot of things you couldn't spend it for. So money just sitting there wasn't doing you much good in terms of your consumer satisfaction. And as a result of that, the saving rate during World War II, which was normally uh, for consumers about, oh, six, eight percent of their personal income, they would save in those days. Uh, the saving rate during the war years was about 25 percent. Not because people suddenly became more future oriented and they wanted, wanted to lay aside a lot more money to, to spend later on or to invest now to have more later on. It's because they couldn't buy what they wanted during the war. So they saved it. They bought, either put it in a bank account or they bought government bonds. And the government was constantly exhorting everybody, buy bonds, buy bonds, buy bonds. And they had automatic bond purchase programs at your employer who would sign you up. And every, every, every month or two weeks, whenever you got paid, a certain amount of the pay would be withheld and used to purchase government bonds for you. So people loaded up on government bonds, which, which had such low yields on them that when you take into account the change in the price level that was happening at the time, they had a negative yield. You know, you weren't really saving anything. You were basically paying the government to take your money. Uh, and not everybody was a financial genius, so a lot of them didn't realize what was happening. Uh, you don't need to be much of a genius to figure that out, but uh, yeah, a lot of people are not much of a genius, let's face it. <laughs> So anyhow, the government sold a lot of bonds to, to, to ordinary people. Uh, most of them it sold to banks, insurance companies, and other businesses. And those businesses were able to buy the bonds because the Federal Reserve System kept undertaking actions that made credit very abundant uh, and cheaply available to the banks. And so they could turn around, buy government bonds, and then use those bonds as collateral to borrow more money from the Federal Reserve Bank, and then keep going, recycling the money this way. It was like a money machine for banks. Uh, they didn't take a lot of risk by doing this, because they kept getting more and more funds made available for them to lend uh, to domestic borrowers, businesses especially. But this was the private situation during the war. And there are other ways of seeing that uh, by looking directly at, uh, at personal consumption. Um, these are some estimates. They're very similar, even though they come from different sources or times, uh, because the basic data for, used to make them are all the same. Uh, this is how much consumers spent during the decade from 39 to 49 for consumer items adjusted for changes in the price level. So historians and many economists even look at these data and they say, well, see, just as we told you, consumers were not worse off. They were not giving up butter in order for the government to produce more guns. Look at it. They're, these numbers are, are, are higher during the war than before the war. Uh, uh, and after the war, they get higher still. So yeah, this was great for consumers. We've got the proof right here. Well, the thing that's wrong with this proof is that I said this is adjusted for changes in the price level. But adjusted how? It's adjusted by using the Consumer Price Index, which the Bureau of Labor Statistics makes up every month and has been making up every month since before World War II. And that's an index of the average of a basket of consumer goods. Okay? So they kept doing that during the war, and then they published the numbers, and the indexes they made were used to, to express everything in dollars of constant purchasing power, as we say, and okay? correct it for inflation. But see, during the war, as I said a few minutes ago, there were price controls on practically everything. So prices were not free to rise 
when without the controls, they would have risen. In other words, higher prices have been outlawed during the war. So, of course, if you go out and check the prices sellers are charging, they're not going to tell you they're charging something above the allowable level with the price control. They're going to tell you that's exactly what I'm charging, the controlled price. Very few mer merchants are so I idiotic that they're going to get themselves in trouble by re reporting a real price that's higher than the legal price. But economists were so idiotic that they would treat these numbers as if they were meaningful. Oh, the consumer price index rises very little in 1943, 4, 5. Sure enough, yeah, that's because it's illegal to raise prices very much, often to raise prices at all. So you don't see posted prices going up that way. But what you did see if you were living in those days is you went to the butcher and you said, you know, hey, Jack, I want a beef, beef roast. And he said, you know, I'm very sorry, ma'am. We're all out. Uh, but, you know, I could let you have one for, you know, a little extra. And the little extra he charged was never going to be reporting to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And so these true prices were much higher during the war than the reported prices. Because this is just basically a legal artifact we're seeing here that's used to adjust consumer spending and make it look as if consumers are getting better off than they really are. Uh, the other things that went on during the war were a lot of discrimination. Okay? If you can't charge more money and discriminate among buyers that way, that's normally what sellers do, right? They, they sell to the people who offer them the most. It's normally perfectly legal, and since sellers want to make money, that's what they do. They sell to the highest bidder. Well, during the war, you couldn't sell to the highest bidder because the highest bid was illegal. <laughs> so you, you could use some other basis. You could either cheat in the way I've just described, or you could sell at the controlled price, but sell, you know, to good-looking people or people of only a certain race or, you know, people you're personally acquainted with or friends of friends, you name it. There could be any number of bases for sellers to discriminate. But since they couldn't discriminate according to price anymore, they resorted to all these alternative ways to allocate their available supplies. And th this made a lot of people much worse off, okay? If you didn't know a butcher, you were hard, hard up against it to get meat. Because the amount you could, you could legally buy uh, was not very much. It wasn't what you wanted. And... and I've heard countless stories from older people I've known who were adults during the war. All the gimmicks that were used to evade price controls. And so there were thriving black markets, you know, people finding ways to charge more than the control price. And in some kinds of products, these black markets were major suppliers for meat, for example, beef especially. A lot of the meat was produced uh, by off-the-record sellers. Uh, farmers would kill kill cattle and slaughter them and, you know, have a truck come in and haul away the sides of beef and somebody would cut it up somewhere, but they had paid a handsome price to get it. Uh, the mafia, okay, you know, whenever there's price control, uh, criminals flourish, right? Because they have, they have a leg up on other people. They're already breaking the law. So they have less to lose if they get involved in some criminal activity. They're already involved in criminal activity. Okay? And we see that right now with our drug market. Okay? Who goes into the drug business? Well, it's usually people that are living pretty recklessly already, at least at the higher levels. Okay? Because you may have to shoot somebody or you know, commit other crime to enforce your property rights. So... You know, you don't, you don't find black markets in beer nowadays, right? But you find it in products that are illegal. Right? And during, during World War II, uh, pro products were either Ill illegal or they were, they were suppressed in their price uh, 
so that you couldn't charge market prices. And so the mafia came to the rescue uh, in several ways. Uh, one way, which didn't really help many people other than the mafia, was they counterfeited tons of ration coupons, booklets. You know, they got these printers that work for them. Because, you know, they, they already had these guys counterfeiting currency. So now they just switch over, counter, counterfeit ration coupons. And so they'd print up all these ration coupons and, and sell them to people for, you know, a cut rate. So people were able to go out and buy more things than they could otherwise have done. Or, or in, in a lot of cases, instead of counterfeiting their ration coupons, they'd steal them. You know, they'd go out and burglarize their ra ration offices and come away with suitcases full of ration books, uh, which were legal but, but stolen. You know. uh, they, they stole a lot of other stuff going to market, like uh, steal gas, gasoline tanker trucks, and, you know, like hold them up, like you know, how the, in the Old West, the, the banditos go out there and hold up the stagecoach. Well, these mafia guys would go out in World War II and hold up a truck coming from the refinery loaded with gasoline. And then they'd haul it off and divide it up in smaller lots and go off and resell it at a hefty profit. So just, you know, criminality flourishes when you have controls on an economy. And that was the case in World War II. And not just criminality in product markets, but criminality in labor markets too, because, because employers were so eager to get workers that they'd do anything, including break the law often. So they looked around for ways to, you know, legally if possible, get workers without breaking the law. And that's how we got into the situation that plagues us today, where health insurance is tied to employment. Okay? Before World War II, medical care was much cheaper, relatively, than it is now, or has been for a long time. But you could get health care insurance before World War II. You just bought it the way you bought life insurance, okay, from an insurance company. And, and during, during the war, when the government put controls on wages, employers couldn't offer higher wages to get the employees they wanted so that they, they, they could offer them benefits of some kind that wasn't considered part of the wage. They started offering people uh, health care insurance. That had never been done. That, employers didn't do that before. There were very few employers that paid employees anything other than their cash earnings. If you wanted insurance, you went out and bought it with your pay. Okay? But now it's been made part of your employment compensation package during the war so so it can be an attraction to workers to come sign up with that empl employer and the employer is not having to break the law to do this and attract the workers but then the system got put in place for millions and millions of people during the war and it continued after the war this is a reflection one reflection among thousands we can enumerate of what I call the ratchet effect. You do something in a crisis, do something in an emergency, and then it sticks around afterwards. If the government has done it in an emergency, you can't get rid of it because then it has vested interests, people who want to keep it for one reason or another. So health care insurance as part of the employment package was one such example of the ratchet effect. So we've got all these things going on. Now, I think I've told you enough already. Uh, that I should be able to make a conclusion. <laughs> the conclusion is that there was no wartime prosperity. Uh, unemployment disappeared because of the draft. There was no miracle of production. The bulge in production represents a combination of capital consumption and arbitrary pricing of military outputs. They weren't sold in markets. They were sold when the War Department guy went out and talked to the guy at Boeing. He said, we want to buy 100 B-29s from you. And they dickered over the price, and they finally settled on something, which wasn't hard because the War Department guy probably was a former Boeing exec. Okay? So Boeing did all right. You know, It didn't make absurd returns. In fact, the smaller war contracting companies earned higher returns on their operations during the war than the bigger ones. But the bigger ones did fine. They did fine. 
Uh, they didn't have to worry about risk anymore. The government would bail them out no matter what kind of trouble they got into, including their own ineptitude. So the war contractors did, did, did fine, but, but the prices they put on all these things they sold to the Navy Department, the War Department, the Maritime Commission that produced all these ships carrying supplies abroad, uh, those are just arbitrary. They were meaningless. Prices that are set by administrators, not set by people spending their own money in the market, don't have any real opportunity costs. Decisions are not made the same way. They're, you could pick a random number almost and treat that as the price. Uh, so these prices were used, and, and then all the stuff the government paid to buy bombs and airplanes and tanks, it got added to gross domestic product because government spending for final goods and services is part of GDP. But when you, the government is spending such a large part of the total spending in the economy, the official accounts tell us it's about 40% during the war, uh, when it's spending a huge amount like that, it has a huge effect. It swamps everything else that's going on in the economy so far as the value of what's being produced is concerned. So the wartime bulge, the miracle of production, is an accounting artifact for the most part. And what isn't an artifact is uh, just capital consumption. Not counted as consumption, but counted as a good thing. <laughs> and so it's backwards besides being inaccurate. And finally, you know, our consumers that are supposed to be having it great aren't having it great. They can't buy a lot of the most important things they want to buy at all. Uh, many of the things they, they have to buy, like food, clothing, subject to rationing. Uh, they can't get gasoline or tires for their cars in more than tiny amounts. Their cars are wearing out year after year. They, they can't even get spare parts a lot of times for their old cars. Uh, no new cars to replace them with. So every, the automobile stock wore out very quickly. Same for taxis, buses, trains, trucks. All these transportation industries are up against it because the, the trucks being produced are military trucks. They're, they're going overseas somewhere to carry the army and its equipment around, or jeeps and so forth. So. It's not a consumer paradise. It's just a bad time. It deserves to be called another five years of depression. It's not like the depression of the 30s because there's no mass unemployment. There's mass enslavement. There's mass enslavement. Now, which would you rather have, mass unemployment or mass enslavement? I'll take the unemployment myself. But that's what happened. And, and Americans don't want to call this enslavement. They think it somehow sullies the honor of these guys who were enslaved and went out and fought. There's no honor to be sullied, okay? This is a horrible thing, any way you look at it. Uh, so uh, they just had the bad luck to, to get hauled in and made military slaves because they, they didn't want to go to prison. I don't blame them in most cases for making that choice. Well, in some cases I blame them. Some of the Christians should have known better. Anyhow, that's a topic for another day. We have time for like one or two questions. Any, any questions? Mm -hmm. um, this is kind of a general question about um, economy and depressions and recessions in general. Right. Um, how much of the negative effects of a recession are due to the psychology of the general public Basically, they're being told that they're in a recession or in a Great Depression, and then they act and spend as if they're in a, a depression. Um, and then conversely, once your you know, economy starts booming, you're told that you're out of the recession, so you start acting and spending as if things are great. I think nowadays it has some small effect. Uh, but you, know, you don't have to tell people when they're in economic trouble. They know it. You know, there's there's this kind of saying that goes around: a, a recession is when you're unemployed. A depression is when I'm unemployed. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, you know, people people know their situations pretty well, and so they can't be fooled uh, too much. But nowadays, you know, as you say, 
they get a lot of reports like this. These reports didn't exist uh, before World War II. Uh, there was a lot of debate in the early 30s about how much the unemployment rate was because it wasn't collected the same way it was afterward. Uh, so now we have the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the Census Bureau constantly collecting data used to estimate the unemployment rate. They didn't do that uh, until the 1940s, really. So uh, people didn't know this, even if they would have believed it. Uh, there were just a lot of counterclaims being thrown around. Any more? Well, I, there's one more. Hey. Uh, you said that during the war, the government issued war bonds that effectively were outpaced by inflation. Yes. Resulting in a negative yield rate. Right. Would that not be a good investment for the government then? Sure, for the government, it's great. <laughs> so the negative effect of the government taking on debt in the form of those war, bond, war bonds is actually net, uh, negated by their interest rate. It's, uh, it's another way of levying high taxes on people. Okay? Inflation is always a tax, uh, but it's not called a tax except by economists. Okay? But uh, you could levy a tax on me in two, two ways. One, you could say, you know, you owe me 10% 10, 10 of your income. And so I'd have to, you know, fill out my form and send you in the, the appropriate amount the way I do now. The other way would be that you don't tell me I owe anything. You just issue a lot of new money and you spend it. The government spends it for whatever purpose. And then effect of its doing so is that it makes all the existing money worth 10% less. Well, it has effectively done what a tax does. It transfers real resources from people to the government. Okay. Only this time it's done without filling out any forms or anything. It's the invisible tax. So if you sell them bonds, you can have another kind of invisible tax if the inflation rate is outrunning the nominal yield on the bonds. And that's what happened during the war. Even if you use the control prices, they were still outrunning the yield on the bonds. The bonds yielded practically nothing. The long-term bonds yielded about 3%, and short-term government securities yielded more like 1%. So. It's a bad deal even without the inflation, but it's a terrible deal for the bond owner, <laughs> holder, uh, with the inflation thrown in. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. You're the last. I'm finished now. <laughs>